So uh, without too much further ado, um, I'd like to uh, start the uh, opening keynote, which is going to be me moderating a panel of uh, three uh, up and coming free software developers, uh, Alyssa Rosenzweig, Tawa of the Debian Project, and Aaron Moon, uh, who's written uh, Rustedon, which is an uh, activity pub uh, compatible uh, implementation in Rust. And uh, yeah, I couldn't be more excited to have them. So if I could ask them to uh, please come into the chat, we can uh, get things started. Hello. Morning. Hey. Hi. Uh, so first of all, if you could uh, slightly uh, lower my voice coming out of your uh, speaker, sorry. And then, all right, so could you each give you, uh, introduce yourselves a little bit and talk a little bit about uh, what you do, what projects you work on, uh, just giving the audience in general background? Sure, I'm Alyssa Rosenzweig. I'm a uh, free software hacker working at Collabora on the free software graphics drivers um, for Mali GPUs, the Panthros project. And I, uh, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to work on free software every day of my life. And uh, it's, I'm really grateful to be speaking here. I'm Tal. I've been involved in free software for about four years now, mostly with Debian, but with a handful of other things too. Uh, I'm currently a Debian developer and not uploading. Um, I mostly work on DevComp organization stuff, um, the trademark team, and I'm also an application manager for new members of the project. Um, for those of you listening who haven't heard of Debian, it's an operating system that by default um, is made up of only uh, Libra software packages and works with uh, numerous different architectures. Uh, Aaron? I'm Aaron. I, um, my actual work involves digital signal processing and machine learning. My free software work has focused mostly around um, decentralized social media and especially the ways that we can give users power to customize their own world when they're existing online. Uh, great. Yeah, so that's really exciting. Um, and since we're like focused on freeing the future this year, I'm wondering if I could ask each of you um, something about how you envision the future of free software, um, you know, whether that's your absolute like utopian dream or if, you know, tempering it a little more realistically. But uh, seeing it in the immediate future or the long term future is obviously something we're all here uh, and interested in in talking about. So I wonder if we could just run down the uh, list again and get uh, some responses from you on that. So I definitely share everyone's free software dream, the free software utopia where all software is free. Um, I don't think the question is where we're going, it's how we're going to get there. And as I see it, um, to get to this free software utopia, uh, we're at an inflection point and what we do uh, as individuals and especially the community in uh, these days will have long-term impacts on whether we uh, reach that dream or whether we go wild. And I see one of the biggest factors impacting us is the uh, fear, the uh, dichotomy between driving ourselves in fear and driving ourselves in hope. This is a fact that some of these awful components right now do found their philosophy on fear and I've been guilty of this myself. Uh, fears of surveillance, fears of censorship, I think we may have lost uh, Alyssa and Tawa. Uh, but Aaron, if you're still there, could you uh, respond to what you envision the future of free software being? Oh, wait. OK. They're back. <laughs> uh, sorry, Alyssa, could you uh, backpedal a little bit? We, we lost you. Sorry. Oh, you're fine. Uh, as, I, as I say that um, uh, some, some of us have founded our philosophies on fear, and I'm not going to say that these fears of surveillance or surveillance capitalism are things that we should not be fearing, because it is a fact that the proprietary is going to affect these fears and affect this dystopia. Um, but at the same time, I don't think this Fear 
I don't think this approach is sustainable in the long run. Um, and what I think as a community and as individuals, we need, we need to embrace optimism is the fact that if we don't personally believe that free software can win and that we'll find this free software utopia, why should anybody else believe us? Our focus has to be building, building up software and creating this future for ourselves, not being fear from the proprietary software around us. Um, it's a fact that there is more at stake for software freedom than there has been in the entire history of the free software movement, um, which is why it's more critical than ever that we get this. Um, because even on an individual level, this optimism is critical for us as free software activists. We need to empathize and support each other, not demonize each other when we're not meeting perfection in a bar where perfection is impossible to meet for many of us. Um, when we uh, judge each other, we're breaking apart as a community. And when we judge ourselves, we're on a one-way ticket to burnout. Um, but I don't want to make this all doom and gloom because I don't think this should be doom and gloom because the fact is, I think there is a huge reason to be optimistic because the fact is, we are winning as a community. It's easy to lose sight of that when we look at all the things that are going wrong in the world. Uh, but it is a fact that we are able to perform entire tasks with exclusively free software. We have free software running at lower levels of computing than had happened uh, in the history of the movement. There are entire sec segments of society which are built exclusively on free software or predominantly on free software or proprietary software is foreign. Um, we should not be understating these victories. We are, we have made incredible progress, and we are continuing to progress at an incredible rate. Um, so, the important thing for our, the future of free software is that we remember that we are, we do have so much steam going for us. We are moving so quickly, and we have come so far. And as long as we keep the, keep the goal in mind, and we don't uh, distract ourselves with fears for the present. I do think we can win. Absolutely. Uh, Tyler? So when I think of the future of free software, um, and while I have a place in my heart for software like uh, Gear PG and PGP, um, that's not what I think of when I, when I envision the future of free software. I envision tools that are useful to their users and to people who aren't technical. Um, and that's not to say that tools like NoVG haven't had great historical importance and aren't still important today. But I, I think that if you asked some random person on a bus to, to use GNUPG properly, they would not be able to do it. Um, I want software developed with uh, everyone in mind, uh, not just the developers of it. And I think that a project that does this particularly well is the Tails project. Um, right from near the beginning, they conceived of a set of personas, of theoretical users uh, that they would design their software for. And um, developing with your users in mind, and often your users are non-technical, is I think for me one of the only ways that we can see free software being adopted by everyone. Uh, Aaron? I strongly agree with Paula in the sense that free software has definitely made huge advances in adoption, especially in industry and in academia, but this is mostly as highly technical tools. Um, and the while the movement of free software has started to think more like tales about usability by end users, we're still not to the sort of the sort of utopian point for me would be where software is usable um, and free, but you can also dig into it because right now we have these we have usable software, but you can't actually inspect it. If you want to go deeper, you can't modify it you can't twist it to do what you want that's the sort of like classical free software um advantage that i think is is one of the big reasons we really need usable tools to replace or augment things that people want to do because there's there's a lot of platforms right now that just free software isn't really filling a usable alternative to and the more we can do that the more we can um let people have control over their own digital environments, over their own self-expression. In general, customization is good. Giving people control over their own um, their own environment is honestly, for me, the, the goal of working on free software. 
Yeah, and on like a different tack, I'm wondering, uh, kind of spinning off of that notion of control, Alyssa, I'm wondering if you could uh, talk about the importance of uh, free firmware to users that you know may not see it as a big issue or who you know may not appreciate like the the importance of doing it uh, in freedom. Uh, sure. So, first of all, I want to preface this by saying that issues of freedom at these low levels like firmwares and firmware and drivers are community issues not individual issues um it's i'm not here to tell somebody who wants to run a GNU linux system but needs this one piece of wi-fi firmware that uh they should just give up on computing because i don't think this is uh the this is the individual it's as a community we have the decision to be pushing freedom or accepting the proprietary and i think we have to be 100 percent committed to freedom if we ever want to reach that uh, dream of free software uh, because it is a fact it is a fact that uh, software choices uh, spiral because software has complex interdependencies um, when you have a single piece of proprietary software that will depend on other pieces of proprietary software, which are designed to interoperate with other pieces of proprietary software. And you end up with an increasing spiral of proprietary. And the equilibrium here are proprietary operating systems. And that is uncomfortable. But the principle works in the exact same way for freedom. When you have a single piece of free software, it depends on other pieces of free software, which are designed to interoperate with other pieces of free software. And that spirals up into the equilibrium of primarily free operating systems like the GNU Linux machines, which uh, I'm sure we're all using, um, and the occasional BSD user who I'm sure is in the audience. <laughs> um, uh, and so for me, uh, firmware is definitely in that category of existing in an ecosystem, because proprietary firmware is designed for proprietary drivers, which are designed for proprietary operating systems. Free firmware is going to be designed for free kernels, for free operating systems. and while the choice of freedom or using a proprietary firmware for any one particular device or for one particular user may not be the be all and end all um, as a community it absolutely shifts uh, our how we approach free software is um, what we have today is that uh, system distribution system distributions like debian and triscoll are faced with the question of Um, I, I don't think asking users to simply not use graphics or not use uh, Wi-Fi is really a sustainable approach for us. But on the other hand, if you start, if you say yes to packaging this one firmware, you're going to be packaging a lot more proprietary software very quickly, and this creates a very uncomfortable slippery slope for us because of all these dependencies. And different different free software projects have resolved this in different ways. Um, but I would much rather see option three, have the firmware be free to begin with and not even have to uh, choose between these two. And I think we're getting there. Yeah, definitely. And I'm wondering like uh, on that future note, like how you see the tides kind of shifting, is it shifting more towards um, people who, uh, you know, are we shifting more towards free firmware uh, collectively or, or is there enough of a kind of requisite pushback from proprietary companies where there's actually much more non-free firmware than ever before? Uh, maybe not in sheer numbers, but in terms of uh, general, general trends. So I think it depends on um, which specific sector of uh, software you're looking at. Um, and this goes beyond just firmware. There are certain spaces where free software is winning and proprietary software is virtually non-existent as Tao and Aaron pointed out. There are other segments where it's the other way, unfortunately, and we still have work to do. Um, and even within firmware and drivers, um, there's a spectrum. Um, I think one place where we've made tremendous progress is the community, which I'm grateful to work in, the, uh, graphics drivers for embedded machines, where 10 years ago, um, you, you had to rely on proprietary software no matter which GPU you picked. And that 
it wasn't even an option to be uh, using uh, free software on any of these machines um, if you wanted your 3D graphics to work. But then uh, Libby and Rob Clark got to work and uh, we've picked up steam as the, move as the movement has been on. And now we have contributions from numerous corporations, including those who work on, who um, supposedly are working on proprietary versions, but now contributing to the free software ones because on some level, I guess we won them over. Um, we're shipping this free software in production. Um, there are users of these devices who don't even know that they're using these free, free graphics drivers, but they're there. Um, and there's about a single uh, company whose chips do not have free drivers right now, either community or officially. And they have a job, a job offer up on their website looking for a uh, graphics driver with uh, free software and Linux experience to develop a free software driver. So I think that's a, I think we've come a long way. Um, I see spaces like what uh, Wi-Fi firmware is somewhere where I don't think we're doing as well, but I'm hopeful that um, given the in tremendous progress we've made on graphics, um, I think we are we will be able to tackle those challenges too. Yeah, definitely. And then um, kind of moving from the the area of like you know software to software interaction or very low level level interaction, I'm wondering if we could kind of shift uh, to talk to Aaron for a second about like user to user interaction. Um, Aaron, could you could you uh, say a little bit why you think uh, decentralized social media is important in general? Um, maybe to those who are unfamiliar with it or only have like a vague sense that like oh yeah, there's this Twitter alternative and it's and it's out there. Uh, what's what's the kind of uh, element that that makes it crucial to user freedom? I'm wondering. Yeah. So quick, uh, quick background info if you don't aren't familiar with the terms in decentralized social media decentralized just means that there's not one main one main service provider so right now what is usually what people are usually talking about when they're talking about decentralized social media is federated social media where you have a bunch of servers each of which hosts a number of users and then these servers form a constellation which shares data and transparently it's like being on twitter you can talk like that's the classic example you can talk to anyone else in this constellation of servers transparently like you're both on a traditional centralized service um and a lot of the advantages people usually talk about are like censorship resistance or you're not beholden to a big company um and those are like in theory great but they also sort of offer different problems because it's really easy to get bad actors on decentralized networks and you have to sort of develop these these community uh values you're sort of forced to actually deal with things in a way that's more uh You have to actually ask your users because otherwise they'll just leave. You have to have communication between people. Um, and it's the the advantages of federation I see are not so much the ones people typically talk about um, because just because they often add that onus of moderation of additional compute capacity required to process this sort of transparent, um, the illusion of one server. They're instead the fact that like each of these, each of these effective or especially in federation, these these nodes that people cluster around, they tend to specialize. They're not just like some generalistic um, collection of people. There are a few maybe large ones in which there's a large collection of people share or a large collection of people that is relatively, uh, are relatively heterogeneous, but you see a lot of small servers with a very specific purpose, um, which end up sort of connecting to other servers in a way that is not necessarily uniformly distributed. You see people building networks based on what they're actually interested in. 
And you see people that run servers building their networks for their users in ways that specialize to what those people are actually interested in. So while there's this, this huge additional moderation challenge, which requires constant community involvement and actually like paying attention to what's happening to other servers and whatnot, you get this advantage in that communities can become very specialized. Users can have very deep relationships with the people that actually run the hardware and software that they're using. And additionally, the software is gradually, and this is one of the things I've tried to work on a lot, getting better at actually allowing users to customize their world without even talking to their administrator. So I guess user control and community um, cohesiveness are some of the, the most fascinating aspects of distributed social networks to me, because they really allow people to um, form social networks that are way more, uh, maybe complex than you would on one homogenous server, one homogenous platform delivered by a corporation. Mm -hmm. And then um, kind of another utopian question. I'm wondering, like, do you think that, you know, for lack of a better word, there's too much uh, parroting on the part of uh, federated social media of the, the dominant forms of social media? And on that note, like, what might a kind of fully free uh, uh, social media service look like if it kind of took users' freedom and users' autonomy kind of as its starting basis? Or would it end up looking a lot of the same like uh, it does now? I definitely think that there's a lot of, like you said, parroting, where mm -hmm. if you look at the large, and I'm guilty of this too, um, if you look at the large federated social media applications right now, the one that everyone has probably heard of by now is Mastodon, which is basically a Twitter clone. It does a bunch of things different than Twitter, in a lot of ways better than Twitter, but it's basically a Twitter clone. There's uh, PixelFed, which is an Instagram clone. There's um, PeerTube, which is a YouTube clone. There's a bunch of, there's like, clone very loosely in that we're not necessarily replicating everything that these platforms are doing right but like we haven't exactly explored what the limits of the actual like underlying protocol are a lot of what we've done has been replicating sort of the traditional um social media systems as facades over the underlying uh federation protocols and uh to your question about what I think the utopian or ideal federated social platform would be, I, I think it's really fallacious to say that there's one would be my, my take. Yeah. Because the more I've played around with different sort of social media paradigms and the more I've observed people actually using them, I don't think you can just have one platform, which is everything to everyone. And I think it's a really bad idea to try to do that. And I think that's like, that's sort of how you become Facebook, right? <laughs> so I think the, the diversity and people trying just absolutely crazy ideas on, on the Fediverse is actually a really good thing. And I'm, I guess what I would like to see is more of um, more software which has deeper ways for users to customize their own experience. So like I've talked in the past about like Tumblr theming uh, and um, WordPress plugins, Wikipedia is really complicated like transclusion and template system. These aren't necessarily things we want to replicate, right? Because they can be really technically overcomplicated and bad in a lot of ways, but there's sort of, there's very strong examples and precedent for people being able to control their own worlds in ways that are really complicated um, and people actually using them, right? Like often we build customization options and expect no one to use them, but we have a lot of examples of people who are not even necessarily technical taking systems that are free or nominally somewhat open source even and actually looking at what they're doing without necessarily a huge amount of technical understanding and customizing their own world because they want to feel more comfortable on a platform um and i think that is a thing that i would like to be able to give to people with my work in general no totally that's that's a great answer um so 
moving back to someone we haven't maybe talked to so much yet. Uh, so Tawa, I'm interested in um, maybe explaining to to me and to everyone else uh, if they're not familiar with the kind of inner workings of Debian, which can often be very complex. Uh, what does the non-uploading part of the Debian developer title mean exactly? Sure. Um, so being a Debian developer is effectively a recognition by the project that you are part of the project as someone who can vote in the elections and uh, formally claim to be a member of the project. Um, whether you're an uploading developer or not, you go through um, over the course to a, of a few months to about a year, um, a process that basically serves to make sure that you understand the procedures and the philosophy of Debian and that you've made contributions to the system. Um, Debian developers uploading also have the ability to upload any package to the archive, uh, whereas non-uploading developers can only upload packages that they've been authorized to. I think that um, what I really appreciate is that Debian explicitly recognizes the um, contributions that aren't necessarily code um, or packaging of their users. And I think that there's um, a lot of valuable contributions that can be made in spheres outside of um, code. So in a sense, um, part of my responsibility as a Debian developer is to um, represent those contributions when I'm voting in elections or when I'm uh, otherwise working on Debian. Um, I got involved in Debian um, after uh, working on DebConf, uh, which was uh, in Montreal at the time. But I've also been involved in both the trademark team, which um, is responsible for uh, making sure that Debian's trademark is being used appropriately, and um, as an application manager to help other people through the process of becoming Debian developers. Yeah, and then, um... On that note, I'm wondering, like, so Debian has this, uh, you know, way of, of of appreciating or recognizing like the contributions of people who maybe are not software developers, um, and you know, hence the hence the non-uploading distinction. Um, is that something that a lot of uh, free software projects are emulating, or rather, um, are there enough free software projects that are uh, that are uh, recognizing the contributions? Of people who don't contribute code, say like documentation, or that just help in the uh, community organizing aspect. I think that for smaller projects, it's not as um, potentially relevant. But I think that once a project grows, like the contributions of um, of people who don't necessarily write code are important to recognize. And I think that in my experience, I've seen a fairly decent job of that being done all around. Yeah. No. Totally. Um, so you mentioned uh, getting involved with uh, Debian as part of DevConf. Was there anything in particular that made you want to get involved with like the community uh, organizing uh, aspect in general? Or was it just kind of uh, something that suddenly occurred to you? Yeah, so one of the reasons why I really enjoy um, contributing to DevConf is, despite having basically gotten into it by coincidence, um, is that um, I really enjoy the diversity of people that participate in Debian. Um, we have philosophy professors, we have chorists, and we have everyone in between. And I think that while free software is certainly lacking in diversity in many aspects, it also has the potential to bring lots of different types of people together. Um, and I think that for people who want to get involved on the more like, behind the scenes organizational side of things, I think that there are lots of teams that will say what their needs are. And I think that just finding something that you can help with and asking, hey, is this the most effective way to help with that is often one of the best ways to to uh, contribute in, in that sort of way. Yeah, definitely. And then um, opening it back up to everybody for a second, um, I'm wondering if there's anything particular in your personal background that's uh, proved, a, proved, proved a challenge to your work on free software or has like impacted it uh, significantly, whether whether that's positively or negatively. Um, often we bring, uh, when we come to these projects, we bring you know uh, part of ourselves with us in terms of identity or anything else. I'm wondering if there was a, a particular uh, you know facet of yourself that that either uh, came into conflict with an existing pre software community, or or kind of on the other end, like may have affirmed that that particular part of your uh, background. Um, sure. So. 
I'm a, I guess I should self-describe as quirky. <laughs> um, I think you can paint you can paint labels on me, but no, I'm quirky. <laughs> um, and um, I'm I'm part of various uh, communities which have been traditionally underrepresented, for instance, in parts of the industry. Um, but I I have definitely found a home for myself in free software. Um, I know many people have not been so lucky in various uh, less welcoming parts of um, free software and outside of free software, but uh, my experiences have been overwhelmingly positive, honestly. I have found many people in free software are very open-minded about a lot more than just software freedom, and I feel very uh, welcome and accepted in, with other free software developers and non-developers alike. And I'm, I think that might be one of the reasons I've stayed after all these years. Um, so I'm not going to pretend things are all rosy. Um, the same quirks that can cause me challenges um, just in day-to-day -day tasks uh, can tr cause challenges with respect to free software. Um, the same sorts of uh, black and white thinking, for instance, and obsessive thinking, um, which for many people can manifest as you know, obsessing over uh, hand washing, for instance. Um, you can also see that play out with respect to software. If you, if traditionally people end up having this tendency to see parts of the world as clean and parts of it as unclean, we can get the exact same psychology seeing software as clean or free and or unclean as, or non-free. And then when you meet that day that you finally need to use a single proprietary package for whatever the most, the tiniest reason is, that can cause tremendous anxiety, which is ties back to my worries about fear driving free software. Because if it's one thing if that anxiety drives you to build a free software replacement, in my experience, um, it can just drive you to become disillusioned with free software. And I don't want, I don't want people to fall into that pit because that's not, it's not helpful for you as an individual. It's not helpful for the community. Um, obviously, if you're having clinically significant issues, that's something to you know, talk to a therapist or psychologist or somebody. I am no, I am none of those things. I am not here to give you advice. Um, but just in my experience, um, there can be very complex interaction between our free software lives and our personal lives. Because the fact is, we are living in a, a world of defined software, and we're choosing to pick free software as I believe we should. That means we're living a life intertwined with free software. I, I think I echo Alyssa's feelings um, regarding the openness in certain parts of the community, and I think that it's important to remember that that doesn't happen on its own. It takes a lot of effort from a lot of people to make sure that communities are open and welcoming. And I I really appreciate that that work is being done in certain free software communities, and I think that that's extremely important work to do. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Aaron? I definitely echo the same feeling that free software has definitely been more accepting than other communities of specific things about myself but like a lot of my experience has been sort of conditioned on um trying to escape from other stuff that was going on in my life uh so and I also feel like I don't necessarily have the most complex or interesting situation of the people in the room. So um, I think one of the things that's definitely more than my personal background as, that's helped me working in free software has just been listening to others and learning about them because people in free software like i feel like we've said this like three times are very very um i mean and people definitely have had to put in this work but very diverse by virtue of software being something that touches literally everything nowadays <laughs> hell yeah um uh and because everyone has to use software everyone like has some chance of ending up getting into free software which is which is really great um and I guess 
it's been a really uh, incredible community to be part of in a lot of ways. And I, I don't have anything particularly useful to add on to what Alyssa and Tawa said, but other than thank you. <laughs> no, that was great. Um, and yeah, so I, I think part of the question that we're talking about now is um, is community building, right? It, it's it's having uh, you know the the community that a new contributor first comes to be be a welcoming community. So Tawa, I'm wondering, um, in your experience uh, organizing on the community side of Debian, uh, what are the what are the major obstacles kind of facing that type of uh, community building and organization? Are there any in particular, or is it kind of specific from project to project? I, I think that one of the challenges that um, particularly in free software, but elsewhere as well, uh, to community building is is leadership. Leadership positions, I think, are a lot more difficult than, than people imagine and can be fairly thankless jobs. And that's, that's not to say that leaders should be shielded from criticism. I think that constructive feedback is extremely important. But leadership positions are particularly susceptible to fatigue and burnout. And for larger projects, uh, that risks having a significant effect on contributors. I, I think that leaders who are, are willing to step back and recognize that maybe they should leave room for others with different backgrounds, experiences, and views are is, is a valuable skill. And I think that whether or not we agree with the policy of leaders, we, we owe it to our projects to recognize their work. I also think that projects that are smaller or spot out as like hobbies or personal projects are bound to run into growing pains. I, I personally don't have the experience of having to hand over control of something that I've worked on for countless hours to someone else, but I, I can't imagine it comes easily. But if you if you start to have a project, if you start a project without envisioning the day when you'll have to give up some amount of control of it, I think that you're bound to run into issues. Yeah, no, definitely. And then uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't hit on uh, some kind of like elephant in the room type issues. Uh, so on that note, uh, kind of opening up another uh, open-ended question. Um, so, you know, half of, the half of the people in the world now own a computer. That computer is their mobile phone, uh, which is invariably running non-free software. And um, at the same time, surveillance is becoming a lot more normalized. You know, you just see it in the news and you see it everywhere, really. And, and you know, and that kind of leads me to think or wonder maybe like, do you, do each of you see freedom as becoming, are people, are people kind of approaching the situation with more apathy than usual or are a sense of like defeat or something? Because, you know, as, as surveillance and as, um, you know, non-free non software in a way becomes more normalized, uh, how do you think, how do you see people responding in terms of respecting their freedom and privacy? And how would you like respond maybe to somebody who says like, well, you know, it's hopeless because, uh, you know, Facebook already knows everything about me or, you know, Google already knows anything about me. So there's no point in even trying. Uh, that's that's a kind of big topic, but I'm wondering if we could we can try and uh, tackle a little bit of that uh, together. Um, I definitely agree that uh, mobile phones are an elephant in the room for us right now as a community. Um, in my personal life, I can attest that when I switched over to running a free operating system on my laptop and uh, eventually to running almost exclusively free software on my laptop, um, yes, there were some transition related pains, uh, but for the most part, I can still do all the same tasks I would normally do. Nobody else is affected by that decision. Um, the when I when there is proprietary software required, it's usually coming in the form of JavaScript, which can is a thorny issue that I am uncomfortable with. But we have browsers like any other operating system, right? Um, phones have been a very different story. Um, for a while, I was very vocally against carrying a phone. Um, but when my living situation changed, I didn't see another option. And I very reluctantly and very sadly uh, carried a phone um, running, uh, running lineage. So not entirely proprietary, but nowhere near the freedom status I would like. And I always felt uncomfortable about that. Um, more recently, I and say, I've been trying to go back and say, no, I don't want to carry a phone anymore. I can manage with what I have. And I mean, I'm getting there, I guess. 
in my own life, I can make this pro progress. I no longer carry the physical device, um, but I still have the physical uh, lineage or Android device for using Signal. Um, if that was running on my laptop, I'd get rid of that too. Um, I no longer have self-service. Self I no longer pay normal for cell phone. I instead am, have a number through jmp.chat, which I can absolutely recommend, $3 a month, um, to get a cell phone number that can be texting all over, following all over XMBP and SIP. I was not paid to endorse this. I'm just a happy user of this. <laughs> um, so I really, I can tell that people in, for instance, jmp.chat communities, XMBP, matrix communities, um, people working on the various GNU Linux phones, um, post-market OS, for instance, people are working on this issue, um, but this is definitely a much harder situation than I think most of what we've been up against historically. Um, but all I can say is that remember how hopeless some of our other software situations have looked 10 years ago and look where we've come in there. Um, I, I have hope for that we'll get this figured out today, and I think we are on the right path. Um, as to apathy, I think that just like there are people that are only so concerned about their personal health, for example, me included, there are bound to be people that are only so concerned about freedom and privacy, and I, I don't think that they can be faulted for that. I think that the the free software to best respond to the needs of those users, uh, the free software community owes it to itself to make software that is good and that is usable and that is a decent alternative to proprietary software. And if only, if that only convinces the people that are on the edge about it, then that's fine. And the fact that you're attracting more users will likely mean that they'll attract more contributors to build even better software. And I, I'm optimistic that one day the software that, that if we write better software, people will come. Yeah, totally. Uh, Aaron? I feel like phones are definitely part of the problem, but I don't know. I feel like it's difficult to put the, the blame onto specifically like one device, like, oh, this is the last thing we can't conquer <laughs> in free software. Um, and I think part of the thing with phones too is the supply chain is really, really weird. Um, and the, even the way that Android gets like sort of forked and forked and forked by each manufacturer and new like drivers and stuff put in, and it's very, very not standardized. And I, I guess I, I see people trying to fix this, but they often do that by making their own like very expensive hardware that's supposed to be like free and great and whatever and run like free software and like that is that's that's helpful but also i guess it ultimately is sort of a, a like a social problem more than a technical one because with with laptops we have a very strong reason for wanting freedom like we expect and and computers in general we expect some level of ability to interrogate them, ability to take them apart and look at what's going on. Uh, but we don't like always really have that expectation with phones for some reason. I guess people like view them as even more of appliances than computers in general. Um, and I'm not even sure that it's te technically really apathy because if you talk to people, they don't even really view their phone as more than like even people who know that like, oh, you can build a computer or whatever, don't really view their phone as more than like a box that gives them the things a phone gives you. So I, I guess socially people aren't really interrogating like the the sort of technical world around them, which is almost the, the biggest obstacle to free software adoption for me is ultimately a lot of people don't even really realize that there's even a possibility that a phone could be something that isn't completely locked down, especially in today's world of like hyper lockdown bootloader chains and whatnot. Um, so I don't know. I feel like people are definitely apathetic in some sense in that if you look at people, they look apathetic, but I don't think it's necessarily like an, an active choice to be apathetic just as much as a, 
a, a lack of knowledge that there's anything possible other than our current ecosystem and also that there's any advantage in it because i think a lot of people don't don't really see the advantages of free software until they use free software and they're like, oh, hey, doing scientific computing in Python is like 10,000 times better than using MATLAB. Maybe we should do this. Um, but yeah, I don't really have, I don't think there's any easy quick solutions specifically to like mobile device freedom, but it's definitely something that I think we need to look at more critically than just throwing technical resources at it because people have tried to do that a lot and it's not ultimately particularly helpful when maybe you sell a few hundred thousand devices and there's millions of phones being sold from stores from large corporations that are completely never going to run free software. Um, yeah, no, totally. So uh, we have about five minutes left, but I want to uh, squeeze like one more question in uh, for Alyssa and then see if we have any uh, IRC questions. But uh, kind of on a technical connection, Alyssa, I'm wondering uh, what role you see non x86 machines uh, playing in the future of free software. Obviously, it's a it's a direction you're very interested in and one uh, we seem to be heading in generally. So I was wondering if you could just uh, comment on that briefly. Sure. I just, um... As stated, with the free software dream of running free software everywhere at the lowest levels, um, I think we need to be doing the work to push towards that. And as a community, we have done tremendous work freeing machines with x86. Um, and you can run Trustful and other fully free operating systems on these machines, and it's wonderful. Um, but I guess we've hit a sort of uh, freedom wall that there is a certain level of freedom we've gotten to and we can't get further right now and due to various obstacles, uh, management engines, certain firmwares and so forth. Um, and so I think as a community, we need to be transitioning towards freer systems. In the long run, I would love to be using um, fully free hardware as well. I think in the long run, it would be wonderful to be using machines with RISC-V for power, which are uh, free instruction sets. Um, but in the, in the short term, I think it's important that we spread free software um, to predominant uh, non x 6 platforms. Um, for instance, our, our machines have been a personal focus of mine because they are so ubiquitous, for instance, in phones, but also uh, so certain uh, lower power laptops, for instance, like the uh, laptops I run with you know, Debbie and Genome, right? Um, and there is a lot of work to be done to run free software on new architectures. There are a lot of growing pains um, with from distribution support to driver support to just user land software support. And I think as a community, uh, using our machines as our uh, testing ground almost to uh, get ourselves prepared for the next stages of free software, uh, I think that's an important direction to be moving in. Yeah, totally. Uh, thank you. And thanks you all uh, so much for, for participating. Um, so I have a very friendly uh, room monitor, Sarah, here, who uh, will read us uh, one or two questions, hopefully. All right. Hello, everyone. I've been catching up on the chats here. Um, one thing that seems to be coming up in the discussion uh, is this idea of not necessarily apathy but a lack of education or awareness from the broader community and a need to get more people involved, especially non-technical individuals. Um, I'm wondering from your own experience, do you have examples of really uh, successful ways to bring in non-technical community members and to sort of show them the value? Um. I think that that depends on, on what kind of software you're trying to write. If you're trying to write, um, say, chat software, I think that um, showing how, like, um, showing the issues with, for example, using Facebook Messenger versus something freer um, is bound to uh, convince some people. But I, I, I personally think that there are some people that just don't really care. And that, that's okay. 
I write C code. I'm not the one to be asking. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, Aaron? I feel like one of my favorite ways has been, I guess, because a lot of the work I do outside of social media has been digital signal processing for creative purposes. So for music and um, video processing, uh, it can be really fun to just show people like wild experimental software or things that you just really can't do easily with um, with commercial software, because there's a lot of things where software doesn't really exist to do it outside of software, to do a particular task. And um, I guess I guess the, the flexibility of free software has been one of the, the big like selling points when I show it to people. Like, just in general, people are always really surprised when like I'm able to do something quickly that is atypical. And I'm like, I can do this because I can like poke at the bits inside of it and do something a little bit different. And now the problem is solved. And that's like, I think that's definitely really uh, a powerful way to like show people the the advantages of being able to interrogate your system and do things with it that aren't t super typical because like there's a lot of tasks people will sit and do manually and you're like oh i can do this with some free software in like three seconds and they're like just so surprised that that any anyone would ever design software for like a very specific niche purpose yeah and yeah thank you all so much for participating that's all the time we have uh it's been great talking to y'all uh it was it was really great uh thank you all uh hope uh happy having it hacking too <laughs> See thank you, you for having us oh of course yeah, yeah thank you